Uh, how are you all doing? Good. All right. Uh, not that, you don't have to be that good. All right, so human freedom in a post-normal world, what does that mean? Hopefully I as a speaker will figure it out by the end of the talk. Um, anybody know what this is? This is Tahrir Square. Someone said it up front in the expensive seats. Um, this is Tahrir Square in 2011. And uh, as I trip over the mic stand, that's a big crowd, right? A guy named Don DeLillo, a novelist in 1991, said something really important about crowds. He said the future belongs to crowds. For about a couple decades, I thought he was right. I don't believe that anymore. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. I don't think the future belongs to crowds. I think the future belongs to those with the computing power to predict what crowds will do. This is a shot, and if I'm standing in front of it, just tell me to move. This is a shot of a thermal camera watching the crowd at Mecca. It's detecting weather patterns in their movement when sped up. We're at a moment where the crowd has become legible. It's become legible for people like you who are using technology to do ostensibly good things. It's become legible for others as well, for bad guys. Now, to talk about the future of human freedom, we have to talk about the future of totalitarianism. <laughs> and to talk about the future of totalitarianism, we gotta talk about the past. And there's no one better to talk about it than this lady. Hannah Arendt, in 1951, in The Origins of Totalitarianism, she said this important line we will all read and absorb together. And it did not fit on the slide. <laughs> what she says is that before mass leaders seize power, they have to seize facts. They have to seize control over narrative. They have to affect the way we figure out what real is. And that's always been the case for dictators, but now they have a new tool. This is a cell phone case with a picture of Picasso's Guernica on it. And I think it expresses the dire moment we're in now. The tool that we have embedded with our assumptions and aspirations about how it can alleviate poverty, how it can democratize, how it can protect how information communication technologies or ICTs can have an ambient protective effect for vulnerable populations. Well, there's someone else innovating with it too. And here's what they're doing. <laughs> Welcome to the Great Depression. This is Myanmar. We now know that Facebook Messenger has been absolutely critical for spreading hate messages, magnifying violence against Rohingya ethnic minorities. Tens of thousands have been displaced into Bangladesh. Read this sign, supporters of Rohingya are enemies. These are Buddhist monks who are behind many of the Facebook messages. Back in 1994 in Rwanda, the use of radio was absolutely essential to coordinating and initiating the Rwandan genocide. That seems quaint now in the age of social media because they have the Staples Easy button for spreading misinformation and in the case of South Sudan, where I advised UN peacekeeping on early warning in 2015, Facebook helps coordinate and initiate attacks in their ongoing civil war. Oh, anyone think they know what this slide's about. <laughs> Our election, 2016. So social media, information communication technologies have been adopted and adapted by perpetrators of abuses faster than we have adopted and adapted normative frameworks. And what's happening? These are the white helmets. Everyone know who the white helmets are? Syrian civil defense. 
The white helmets have been the targets of a misinformation campaign on social media by botnets, by what's called cyborgs, and by human networks for years now. And what is that really about? It's about delegitimizing their humanitarian status, about making them targets. And for me, as a humanitarian aid worker, this is an unprecedented tipping point. We've always been targets, but now we're targets of the very space, the humanitarian cyberspace in which we operate. And that is a normative framework. So as we think about how information communication technologies are affecting and will affect the future of human freedom, we have to think about norms. So what is a norm besides a character from Cheers? Well, as we enter the decline and fall of the normative framework, norms are where we give our values force. It's where, going back to Hannah Arendt, we create rules to counter the co-option of facts, the destruction of reality, and this is the key line. It's how we establish trust. And right now we are at the beginning of what I call the Third World War. And this Third World War is a war on trust. It's a war on trust in institutions. It's a war on trust between people. It's a war on trust in systems, physical systems, in social systems. And you all, ladies and gentlemen, you're on the front line. So what have we been doing? I love this slide. I've been waiting for this slide all day. This is the opening of the Epcot Center in 1982. It is ridiculous. We've got some jazz hands. We've got people with trumpets. We've got some bell bottoms. We've got some great belt buckles. We have balloons in the background. Well, the world has caught on fire. We have been talking about all of our wonderful magical thinking about what we want tech to do. We've been trying to build the world of tomorrow. That is not your job. What's your job? Don't build goddamn Jurassic Park. Seriously. So what lives in the Jurassic Park of data right now? What are the velociraptors that we can see there? <laughs> well, here's our old friend. What does PII stand for? Shout it out. Personally identifiable information. The problem is, is that as we enter the digital revolution, we did it unequipped with the normative frameworks specific to the data we're now using. What has changed for both dictators, for civil society, and for the populations caught in the middle is that it's not about PII alone anymore. It's about this. Does anyone know what this is? And I don't expect you to, unfortunately. DII. It stands for demographically identifiable information. Information about communities, information about communities that may not even know in the mind of a computer that they are seen as a community. DII is the fuel in artificial intelligence. DII is the basis of what we are not only accidentally generating for good or for bad, but intentionally generating for good and for bad. DII is how we get in part to this, ABI action-based information. Back to Don DeLillo's statement that the future belongs to crowds. The reason it doesn't anymore is because now the crowd being legible, the ABI generated by our innovations, the action-based information also known in my field of the defense of the dark arts at Hogwarts is um, called a kill chain. It's, we're not interested in your social security number says the bad guy, we're interested in when and where you do things. And when and where you do things by community identification, not individual identification. Back to our examples before from Myanmar, from South Sudan, from Syria. So, here's the heart of the matter, folks. Data is people. Data is people. Go get a tattoo that says data is people. I would never get a tattoo, but if I did, it would say data is people. Because data is fundamentally now, and maybe always has been, about people. 
but we're not treating it that way back at the Epcot Center. So, what does data is people really mean besides some guy on a stage saying it over and over again? It looks like this. If you wanna see the world we live in now, this is a family who has just come out of the Mediterranean. They're standing on the shore of Lesbos, and that boy with the tablet is taking a picture as a proof of life to tell his family back in Syria or in the diaspora that they survived. We are now at a moment where not only bad actors are having access to these tools and learning how to use them very, very well with more resources than we have, but affected populations themselves are gaining digital agency. At a moment where we have the largest displaced population in the world since World War II, they are also, and this is a huge piece of good and very bad news, the largest network diaspora, digitally networked diaspora in human history. They were a critical part of WhatsApp's valuation, <laughs> being a plurality of WhatsApp's users at the point of sale to Facebook without homes and running for their lives. Think about that. And so we are at a moment where we don't know how to think about thinking about how affected populations are using information communication technologies. We don't have what we call in my lab at the Signal Program on Human Security and Technology at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, we don't have a management science and an assessment science and a methodology for what we call teledemographic needs assessment. How are populations becoming digitally invisible? How are populations becoming affected by disparities, particularly along lines of gender in terms of digital access? If we are to make Data is people mean something. We have to learn how to assess and to see the differences in contexts and in populations and the disparities. So what it comes down to is not tech. You can't code your way out of this, guys. It's about duty of care. What is our duty of care when we use tech for the populations we seek to serve? And what do we base that duty of care on? Do we base it on a code of conduct? Do we base it on whispers of good intentions? No. We should be basing it on rights. So let me back up a second and get out of my own dang way. Um, here, we've been looking down the wrong end of the telescope at this problem. We start with the lens of the promise of technology. Then we think about how do we operationalize it? Should we have some standards and ethics for it? And then maybe at the end, what rights do people have to the technology itself? When we do that, and we look down the wrong end of the telescope of this journey of adoption, the population becomes smaller. But when we flip it around and we start with the lens of human rights, in thinking of information communication technologies is a rights issue, not a tech issue. The population comes into focus. Then we get our order of operations right. Rights can lead to standards and ethics that can lead to operationalization. And from there, we can talk about what we want to achieve. So here is our contribution. In the summer of 2016, I got really frustrated with innovation. <laughs> I told my team, stop innovating. For six months, we're not gonna innovate a gosh darn thing. And we stopped. We took the no innovation challenge. <laughs> it, it was something. And, and what we did during that time is we read every single piece of international law international humanitarian law, every single European privacy regulation. I don't suggest you ever do that. But we did it. And what we began to realize is looking at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, looking at the Geneva Convention, it's not about inventing new rights. It's about applying the rights we already have to create new normative frameworks. And so what are the five rights that we found? We found that everyone has a right to information during crisis, 
not as freedom of speech alone, this is the big deal, guys, but as part of Article 3, as a right to life, liberty, and security of person, as a right to humanitarian assistance that includes information equal to food, water, shelter, and medicine. That may sound common sense, but it's a big deal. Because right now, we have not formally enshrined that information is aid. The second, people have a right to be protected in how that information is provided. They have a right to be protected from adverse effects, from negligence and malice. They have a right to a minimum standard of data privacy and security. They have a right to data agency. That means going beyond informed consent, beyond even, quote, meaningful consent. Two, they have a right to be notified about how their data will be used. They have a right to participate in the uses of those data. They have a right to be protected from non-consensual experimentation. And then, lastly, they have a right to rectification and redress when they are harmed. So I want to leave you with this wonderful woman. This is Ursula Franklin, the late, great Ursula Franklin. Have any of you heard of Ursula? Go out and, and read everything she ever wrote. She said this, Technology is not the sum of the artifacts of the wheels and gears and rails and electronic transmitter. For me, technology is a system. Technology involves organization, procedure, symbols, new words, equations, and most of all, involves a mindset. Most of all, it involves a mindset. The way you do anything with technology is the way you do everything. That's not my line, it's my friend's line. He's a yoga teacher, he uses it all the time. But the way you do anything with technology is the way you do everything. And the question is, where do we start from in this uncertain and perilous age to put data as people with a duty of care that's based on rights and what we want technology not to do rather than what we magically hope it will do? And I will add one word to this. It also involves power. It involves hierarchies of power. So you are engaged in that struggle as freedom and the future of freedom is changing, as we face the great oppression, not caused by, but in many ways catalyzed by the same tools we use to do good. We must start with asking what is our mindset now and what should it be? Thank you.